This podcast is going to cover step one of cellular respiration, which we call glycolysis. So these are notes that you've already taken, but I just want to want to refer you back to what we've already talked about. So we are just going to be looking at the step one glycolysis. The goals of glycolysis are to make some ATP, but just a small amount, to make these hydrogen ion carriers or molecules that have extra hydrogen ions attached to them, and start the beginning of the breakdown of glucose. The other thing that I want to remind you of about glycolysis is where it takes place. So we've seen this before. Hopefully you have a diagram of your notebook from earlier vodcasts. Glycolysis is going to happen in the cytoplasm, which is the filling of the cell, which surrounds the mitochondria, where the rest of the steps are going to take place. So there are enzymes and things in the cytoplasm that actually help glycolysis to take place there. So to talk about step one of glycolysis, you should have a printout or handout of this diagram already taped into your notebook. And basically I'm going to go through the whole process by filling in the blanks on this diagram. We're going to start with glucose in glycolysis. So glucose is right here in this kind of stop sign shaped um, area. And we have to remember that glucose's molecular formula is C six H twelve O six. And what we're going to do with that glucose is we're going to break it down into two molecules of the same type. Those molecules are called G three P. So both of these little rectangles get a G three P in them. Now how do we do that? How can we take a big molecule like glucose and break it apart? Well, you need some energy. And it might be kind of confusing that we have to use energy at this point to make more ATP or energy in the end. But you can think of it as like a bank account. You know, if you want to invest some money um, to make more money, at, for example, off the interest in a CD or in your savings account or whatever, you have to start with a little bit of money in that account to begin with. Okay, you have to give up some energy, in this case, in order to make some energy. So this is actually usually called the energy investment phase, where we add a little bit of ATP to the process so that we can make more ATP in the end. So that's what these arrows represent. Got ATP over here and ATP over here. This is the energy that's being used or invested. And when we use that energy from ATP, it's no longer ATP anymore. It's something called ADP. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, how that works. Okay, but essentially the overall idea here is that in order to break up glucose into two G3P molecules, we have to change two ATP molecules into two ADP molecules. So that's the idea of the energy investment phase. Now let's get a little bit more specific about what's happening. I'm going to erase this glucose here. All right, so if we look at this ATP versus ADP, and what those letters stand for. This helps us understand what's going on. So ATP, right here, this T, stands for tri. ADP, the D right here, stands for di. The di and the tri refer to the number of phosphates on this molecule. That's a pretty complex molecule, but let's just think about it in terms of phosphates. If we have three phosphates on the molecule, that's adenosine triphosphate. If we have two phosphates on the molecule, that's adenosine diphosphate. So when we go from a tri to a di, essentially what we're doing is breaking off one of the phosphates. So this phosphate right here on the end, we're going to say, gets broken off, okay, because we break a bond, and now we're down to a diphosphate. Now hopefully you can remember from, you know, just general chemistry in ninth grade that anytime you break a bond, you make lots and lots of energy. Okay, so we've got energy because those electrons in the bond are being released. So if we have energy being released by this process right here, and this process right here, that energy from breaking that phosphate bond can then be used to make our G3P molecules. 
Okay, glucose isn't just going to split up on its own. It needs a little bit of investment in energy in order to break it apart. Okay, the last thing I want to say about the energy investment phase of this is we're going to keep track of our carbons through this whole process. So in order to do that, we're just going to make a little note to ourselves as to how many carbons are in each molecule. Glucose, we already said, is C6H12O6. So C6 means there are six, whoop, here we go, six carbons, having problems here. There we go. So there's six, <laughs> try one more time, six carbons in our glucose, and then there are three carbons, because we split it in half, in each of our G3Ps. All right, so we got to keep track of how many carbons there are in each of these molecules so we remember what we're dealing with. Let me just fill in real quick the ones we lost here so that we've got a nice diagram to start with again. So glucose gets turned into G3P, two molecules of G3P. And the way we do that is we have to invest a little ATP to make ADP for each of those G3P molecules. And we go from a triphosphate to a diphosphate, break the bond, release some energy. That energy can be used to break up glucose. Okay, we're halfway through. The next um, chemical that we're going to make in the process of glycolysis is called pyruvate. So that's what these two rectangles at the bottom are. I'm going to write them below just because I know my pen's not going to write that small, but you can put pyruvate right in the rectangle box. It's spelled P-Y-R-U, pyruvate, V-A-T-E. Again, both of these are pyruvate. And they still have three carbons. All right, so it's a different molecule. We're going to change it up a little bit. But the backbone, the basis of it, is a still a three-carbon molecule. So how do we get from G3P to pyruvate? We're not going to be changing any um, of our carbons, but we are going to be changing some of the hydrogens. And this is where we introduce a really important um, chemical compound in this whole process of cellular respiration, and that's called NAD+. So I'm going to write that, oh, in here, I just don't have very much room. Okay, NAD+, and I'm going to try to fit it over here. It happens on both G3Ps, so we've got to put it by both arrows. And what NAD+, is really good at doing, this molecule, is sticking to hydrogens. You can think of it like a bus, you know, like a school bus, and it can pick up the hydrogens and shuttle them to where they need to go. So the hydrogens are like the little school kids. They hop on the bus, they hop on the NAD, and the NAD takes them to wherever it is that they need to go to do what they need to do. So when we add hydrogen ions to the NAD, we end up with a molecule called NADH. Where did that hydrogen ion come from in each case? Well, it came from the G3P. Remember, we're changing the G3P into pyruvate. And the way we, one of the ways we do that is we start pulling hydrogens off of it. Um, and hydrogens are, again, like little kids on a bus, hopping onto the NAD to make this NADH. Back when we talked about the whys of glycolysis, we said it made a little bit of ATP, which we haven't done yet, but we'll get to that. We said it also made some hydrogen ion carriers. These are those hydrogen ion carriers. The NADHs carry the hydrogens around, like little school buses, to take the hydrogen ions where they need to go. The other arrows on the outside of this represent the little bit of energy that's made. So in the process of changing G3P into pyruvate, we break some bonds and shuffle some hydrogens around, and we can actually make two ATP for each G3P. And how do we make ATP? Well, we can reuse ADPs. So two adenosine diphosphates turn into adenosine triphosphates for this particular G3P. Over here on this one, we also get two ATPs made. 
from two ADPs by going from diphosphate to triphosphate. And how would you go from diphosphate to triphosphate? Well, you got to stick another phosphate on, right? So remember how I had written out before. Okay, we've got phosphate. Phosphate is our diphosphate. And then in order to make a triphosphate, we just have to add another one. Okay, so that's what's done here. It's done twice for this side of our model, and it's done twice for this side of our model. All right, so let's count up what we've done so far. So, so far, we've made two ATPs on one side and two ATPs on the other for a total of four. But we also used two ATPs here and here. So we're going to subtract those out. So we're a total of two ATPs that have been made so far. Not such a great deal of energy yet. We also made these two NADHs. So really, so far the outcome of our glycolysis is our two ATPs, our two NADHs, and then these two pyruvates. And that's it. That's all it does. The next two steps are going to take some of these products and do something with them. But we're going to pause there for this vodcast and get to the other two steps at a different time.